chapter 8. Join me in standing in the honor of the reading of God's word, and we will begin in verse number 26 and read down through verse number 30. First Kings chapter 26, or chapter 8, verse 26, down to verse number 30. And now, O God of Israel, let thy word, I pray thee, be verified, which thou spakest unto thy servant David, my father. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven of heaven, uh, behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, but how much less this house that I have builded. Yet have thou respect unto the prayer of thy servant and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to hearken unto the cry and to the, to the prayer which thy servant prayeth before thee today. And thine eyes may be opened toward this house night and day, even toward the place of which thou hast said, My name shall be there, that thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make toward this place. And hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant and of thy people Israel, when they shall pray toward this place, and hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and when thou hearest, forgive. Our text verse is verse number 27. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have builded. We're going to preach on this thought this morning. God dwelling among men. God dwelling among men. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness. Oh God, we think about the, the goodness that you've given us. We've prayed a number of times today, whether it was in Sunday school or the choir, uh, Brother Abraham uh, praying, Lord, your goodness that uh, uh, we know is uh, beyond measure, beyond count. We uh, are unable to count, to enumerate all the blessings of your goodness. Um, but maybe the greatest of all is the giving of your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, sacrificed his life for ours, and not just died on the cross. We're thankful for the cross, but we're thankful for the power of the resurrection, Lord, that you gave him. He rose from the grave, and I pray that you'd help me preach the word of God today accurately. Uh, I, I want to preach your word. I, I desperately desire for you to fill me and use me to, to uh, be a, a vessel um, uh, that uh, it preaches your word. Lord, I, I pray in a, that you'd bless, Lord, in a, in a crowd, a uh, group like this. There may be one or more that have not come to you, that have not sought forgiveness, have not sought uh, to be a, a child of God through your son, Jesus Christ. And I pray that today might be the day where they uh, have a relationship with you, that you desire to have as you've desired to dwell among man, uh, but can't because of our sin. I pray, God, that you would, uh, you would convict. Use the word of God. Use me, I pray. The Holy Spirit would convict. Fill me with your spirit. Fill each hearer with your spirit, I pray. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. You may be seated. Our text as we read this morning is the, the culmination of years of planning, preparation, and hard work. This is the, the grand opening, the, the ribbon-cutting ceremony, if you will, the, the dedication of the temple. The king, David, desired to build a temple of the Lord. Uh, his desire when he brought, uh, uh, he and, and uh, 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 others brought the temple, or brought, I'm sorry, the, the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And, and, and the desire that, time, that day, that time was for David. He said, I have a house I, and I want to build God a house. I, I want to build him a, uh, he's, uh, I live in a house of, uh, of cedar and yet God lives in, in a tabernacle, in a tent. Uh, God's house is a tabernacle, is a tent. I want to build a house. And he said something to the prophet, Nathan said, Nathan, I want to build God a house. And Nathan says, uh, uh, do all that's in your heart. And then as he's leaving, God said, no, Nathan, go back and tell him he can't. And so Nathan went back to David and said, the king, then went back to King David and he said, I'm sorry, but uh, you're a bloody king and you won't be able to build a, a house for me. But your son, Solomon, he can build a house for me. And so David began to, to, to uh, uh, prepare uh, th those last days of his life. He began to, to plan and prepare and collect. And, and, and when Solomon became king, king after uh, a, a while Solomon was allowed to uh, uh, not long after Solomon became king Solomon began the building of the temple and this is the the culmination of of, uh, of that 
uh, years of preparation, years of planning, years of hard work as Solomon uh, uh, is, uh, is, I mentioned the, the, uh, the, 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 the cutting, the ribbon cutting ceremony, the grand opening, the dedication of the temple. That's the passage we have this morning. And we look in chapter 8 of 1 Kings, we see then verse 1 says, Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and the heads of the tribes, the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel, unto King Solomon in Jerusalem. So we see the assembly. And they, uh, that they might bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is, it, which is Zion. And so we have this great assembly of all the leaders and the, the, uh, the princes and, and everyone assembling in the city of Jerusalem for this great day. And then we see the animals in verse number 5, and King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him were with him before the Ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be told nor numbered for multitude. And I think about this day and the, the sights and the sounds and the smells of this day. And I don't think say smells in a, in a negative way. When I think about the animals, you think, well, they must have uh, had a, a, a bad smell. We think of animals, we think of farm animals, and we think of what goes, the smell of a farm. But we're, think, we're talking about a sacrifice. Think about driving past a barbecue place and the smell of that meat that was the smell of the sacrifice. God calls it a sweet-smelling savor. savor. And so the, the, I, I try to picture, if, you're, if you will, in your mind the, the, the sights of all that's going on, the, the, the grandiose uh, 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 day and all that's, that's happening, the, the sounds of all that's happening, and not in this passage, but we see the assembly of, of singers and instruments and all that's happening during this day. The animals, we see in verse number 6, well we see it before this, but in verse number 6, we see the ark of the covenant. Verse 6 says, And the priest brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto his place into the oracle or the, the, the hole or the, 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 the spot of the house to the most holy place even under the wings of the cherubims. We see the abode in verse number 13. Look at verse 12. Then spake Solomon the Lord. Uh, uh, the Lord said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. I have surely dwelt, uh, built thee a house to dwell in a settled place for thee to abide in forever. And so the abode, the house, the, the, the temple that, that is finally established. We know about the tabernacle that God gave instructions to, to Moses from Mount Sinai and, and how that led them through the wilderness and led them uh, and they uh, had that through the times of the judges and through the first couple kings, Saul and David and now King Solomon. We have, a, we have an abode, we have a house, we have a structure for God to live in. We look at the altar in verse number 22. And Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven. And we see the address. And he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in heaven above or on earth beneath who keepeth covenant and mercy with thy servants that walk before thee with all their heart who hast kept with thy servant uh, David, my father, that thou promised him. So uh, he goes back to the promise where David, he says, it's in my heart to build God a, 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 a home, a, a permanent residence, uh, not a, a tabernacle, not a tent, but a permanent residence. And as Nathan said, do all that is in your heart. And God told him to go back. And he said, no, but I promise you, your son can. This passage is the fruition of that promise. This passage is the culmination of all those days of preparation from the promise and the planning, the preparation, the hard work that goes into it. And we look at verse number 27. Well, verse 26, it says, and now, O God of Israel, let thy word, I pray thee, be verified. Let it be true, which thou spakest unto thy servant David, my father. And then he says this, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? A, a rhetorical question, God, will you dwell here? We've done everything we can to build a home, to build a house. Will you dwell here? Can I say this this morning, that God desires to dwell with man? Rather, let me say it differently. God desires for man to dwell with him. God desires for man to walk with him. In, in chapel this week in our Christian school, we preached on Enoch. 
The Bible says that Enoch walked with God and was not. But later in the book of Hebrews and the book of Jude, we get an, a, a little bit of a glimpse of why Enoch was, uh, was not, or God took him, because he pleased God and he was a preacher of God's word. Well, we get the impression sometimes that, that uh, walking with God is someone who's in the corner, in the closet, and, and no one sees a relationship with God, and certainly a prayer time, certainly a relationship with God, certainly a walk with God begins there, but if it stops there, then it's not a true walk with God. It comes out, and Enoch was one that preached. We read that in the book of Jude. He was one that pleased God. And God desires to walk with man. God desires to dwell, for man to dwell with him. God desires a relationship with his creation. Amen. Throughout scripture, we see God uh, uh, um, coming to man to um, have a relationship with him. And, and in this passage, you see Solomon say, Would, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? God abides above and beyond what man knows. Look what he says next. He says, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. I'll say again, God abides, lives, dwells above and beyond what man knows. The heaven the sky, and the heaven of heavens can't contain God. Why would we think that earth could contain God? God dwells in realms that we can't comprehend. He dwells above earth. He dwells above the heaven of earth. He dwells above the heaven of heavens. He dwells above and beyond that. He is not man that would be uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, made obedient to the laws of man, made obedient to uh, the laws of this earth. I saw a bumper sticker the other day. It said, uh, obey the law of gravity. No, it says uh, the law of gravity. Okay, obey, obey gravity. It's the law. <laughs> As if any of us could not obey gravity, right? If I stepped off this platform, I would go down. It's the law. God, the laws of man do not apply to God. He is above and beyond. Uh, even, even, in our, uh, uh, even our, in our imagination, as we try, uh, you look at the news, and, and, and uh, we lived in Houston, Texas for a number of years. We would go down to NASA, and NASA has been, uh, in their preparation for years now, has been, ha, have been planning or trying to, to, uh, to, planning to make an attempt to go to Mars. And I remember three or four years ago going down to NASA and they, you see this video and all this stuff about what they would do to try to get to Mars, to get beyond the heaven. God's already beyond the heaven. He's beyond the heaven of heavens. Those cannot contain him. He's, be, he's beyond those. He's beyond the realms that we could even imagine. Then he says this, but God, verse 27, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I have builded. God cannot be contained, listen, by his creation. Oh, we are his creation. You, mankind, are God's, is God's creation. Don't, don't let the humanist, don't let the, the, the supposed scientist uh, 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 try to fool you. We didn't come from a Big Bang. We didn't come from a, an amoeba. We didn't come from a monkey. We came from God. God created us. Now think, God who cannot be contained in the heaven. The heaven cannot contain him. The heaven of heavens cannot contain him. How could God's creation contain him. Now, I'm certainly not saying that God did not dwell, and that's not my point at all. God dwelt among man. In fact, the, the tabernacle and the temple was God's, not just a picture, was literally God's presence. In fact, we read in verse number uh, 20, uh, verse number 12, verse 13, I have surely built thee in house to dwell in. Verse 12 says, that's what verse I was looking for. The Lord said that he would dwell in the thick darkness, in the cloud, back in the day of Moses, the, 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 the pillar of cloud uh, that, would, that would be over the temple, God's presence. It wasn't just a picture of God's presence. That is God's presence. Amen. God dwelling among man. 
But as Solomon stands in the dedication of the temple, he says, could you be contained here? Is this all you are? Is this all that God is? Is this all God's presence? Or is this just a little bit of God? Behold the heaven of heavens. I'm sorry, behold the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. God cannot be contained by his creation. And then as we continue in this passage, look at verse 28. Yet have thou respect unto the prayer of thy servant. Notice what he says. Even though there's no way that this house could contain you. I mean, <laughs> the heaven can't contain you. The heaven of heavens can't contain you. What makes us think that you, this house can contain you? And yet, you have, look, look, verse 20, verse 28, yet hath thou respect unto the prayer of thy servant and to his supplication. O Lord God, to hearken unto the cry and to the prayer which thy servant prayeth before thee today that thine eyes may be opened toward this house night and day, even toward the place of which thou hast said, My name shall be there, that thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make toward th this place. And hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant and of thy people Israel, when they shall pray toward this place, and hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and when thou hearest, forgive. He said, even though you, the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, you have still, you've hearkened, you've listened to the prayer of your servant, David, and now Solomon, and your, you, this is your dwelling place on earth, that when we pray and we look towards this temple, you will hear. Amen. We know that you're a real God and you desire to be among us and you desire to forgive. That's right. Amen. You are willing to hear. And forgive, even though we know you could. We, this house could not contain you. The heaven of heavens cannot contain you. And yet you have decided to come to man and dwell here amongst us. You have desired. You have uh, uh, answered the prayer. And you're willing to see when we pray and we look toward Jerusalem and, the, and we look toward uh, uh, the temple even today. Many people, in fact, I'm sure there's a number of folks here in our midst who have been to the temple wall and put your hand on the wall of that temple, and maybe have prayed or some will take prayers and write them on a piece of paper, or roll them up and put them in the wall of that temple. Even today, this prayer is being answered. But wait a minute, that temple is not there. That temple was destroyed and one replaced it. And it was destroyed. Look at Revelation. Turn your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 22. Revelation, chapter 22. Look at verse number 1 of Revelation, chapter 22. Now eventually, the Lord Jesus Christ will come. He'll defeat all His enemies. After everything's said and done, Verse 1, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and the either side of the river was there a tree of life, which bare 12, uh, um, 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the, the leaves of the tree, I'm sorry, I'm reading the long chapter, 21. I told you chapter 22, I'm like, wait a minute, this isn't what I thought it was. Uh, uh, 21, 21. I have on my paper Revelation 21. <laughs> Verse 1, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned, adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. You say, hey, there's a new temple that God will dwell among men in this new temple. No. This new Jerusalem that God will create, there is no tabernacle. There is no temple. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their people. Look down at verse number 22. He's continuing to talk about this new Jerusalem that God will create or speak into existence. 
He's describing it, what many think of when they to talk about heaven, this is not heaven, the, the pearly gates and the streets of gold and so forth, that's not heaven, it's the new Jerusalem. Verse 22, and I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Take your Bibles one more time, I'll turn one more book and we'll look at two chapters in that book and we'll be done, John chapter 1. John chapter 1. In the book of Revelation, it says that the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple. And what's that talking about? What does that mean? Look at John chapter 1. Verse number... Let's look at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Verse number 14, and the word was made flesh. What did, what did Solomon say? Would God dwell among men? Solomon said, would God dwell among men? John 1, 14 says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we behold, beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Can I say that God still desires for men to dwell among men? God still desires for man to dwell with him. What a wonderful, beautiful, glorious thought. Amen. That God the creator desires to know and fellowship and dwell with this rotten flesh, with me. What a wonderful, beautiful, glorious thought that God desires to know man, to dwell among men. And Solomon, as he stood there dedicating the temple, said, could the heaven or the heaven of heavens contain him? How could this house? And yet, you loved us enough to hear the prayer of my Father and hear my prayer and answer. God still desires to dwell among men. Look at verse 4 of John chapter 1. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And so we see that this, this light, this word became flesh to dwell among men. Let me say this, God still abides above and beyond what man knows. Look at chapter 2, the next chapter, one more chapter, we'll be done looking at different passages, John chapter 2, verse number, let's look at verse number 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to, uh, to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves, the chargers of money sitting, now this was... Uh, the second temple, this is not Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple was destroyed and then it was rebuilt. And so this is uh, a, an, another uh, iteration, if you will, of that temple. Same place. But Jesus is in this temple, this spot where Solomon uh, dedicated this temple. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the chargers money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves take these things hence make not my father's house and house of merchandise and the disciples remembered that it was written the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up we find that in the book of Psalms that phrase then answered the Jews and said unto him what sign showest thou unto us seeing that thou doest these things. Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple in three days. I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, 40 and six years was this temple in building and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. I said that God still desires to dwell among men. God abides above and beyond what man knows. 
man says, Jesus says, uh, uh, they, 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 uh, the Jews asked Jesus, said, can you give us a sign that you, that, that these things will be, that, that you're, the, you're the son of God, that you're, that you're who you say you are. He said, here's the sign. Here, here, here's, this is how you know that the temple will be destroyed. Three, later, three days later, it will be raised up. This is the sign. This is how you can know that God desires to dwell among men. This is how you can know that I am God. This is how you can know that you can trust in me. This is the sign. I'll be destroyed. And they said, how can this temple be uh, built back up in three days? It took 46 years for it to be built. There's no way. And Jesus was speaking beyond the realm of their understanding. He said, my body is this temple. It will be destroyed. And in three days, it will be resurrected. They didn't understand that at the time. It seems that the disciples didn't even understand that at the time. In verse number 22, when therefore he was risen, it wasn't until after the resurrection uh, from the dead that his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. God, listen, cannot be contained by his creation. You say, what are you talking about? We celebrate this holiday around December. We celebrate in December the time when God came in the flesh, enveloped in the flesh to come and dwell among man. Man is God's creation. And in man, God dwelled among man. He came, born of a virgin, of the seed of God, the seed of the Holy Spirit, dwelling among man, dwelling with man, dwelling uh, uh, with man all around him. No comprehension in most cases that this man was God, is God in the flesh. And for you and for me, because there's sin, uh, 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 I think I rewrote about it in the bulletin, in, in, uh, uh, I think it's 1 Corinthians, talks about uh, uh, Adam, uh, that, that, that sin and death passes upon, I know it's in Romans 5, but also in 1 Corinthians, talks about sin passing, passing to all men, and we all die because of sin, that, that there's Adam, but now there's Christ. And for you and me, because there's, we have a sin nature and we're, we're born into sin and we choose to sin because of that and there's a separation from God and, and there is death and, and no one understands, none of us, no man ever has ever understood life with the absence of death. In fact, how many ever heard the phrase, death is just a part of life? No one has lived forever you don't know anyone who who doesn't plan to die you don't know anyone that that says well I'm just gonna live until I'm X number of years old or continue to live past that no everyone understands in fact we do all kind of thing all kinds of things to try to cheat death and escape death uh, uh, on a regular basis uh, uh, you'll hear commercials or advertisements about uh, exercise, about food, about uh, uh, whatever it is, uh, health insurance, to try to avoid death because it's just a part of us. We, it's a part of, it's part of our understanding. It's a part of man. That was the punishment of man from the garden, that we would die because we sinned. And yet, God dwells above and beyond what man understands. We understand death because we all have experienced it. Everyone in here has been to a, to a funeral at some point. Every one of us in here has had, uh, attended the funeral of a loved one or knows the, about someone uh, dying and, and understands, hey, or maybe you've made a statement like uh, uh, my, my grandfather died of this disease and my dad died of this disease and so I have to uh, be careful because I have to watch what I eat or I have to do this to make sure that because this runs in my family and death is something we try to, we, we talk about and we try to escape all the time and yet, God lives beyond death. <laughs> How is that possible? He lives in realms, in a realm beyond what we understand. God cannot be contained by creation. No more than that building, that temple. <laughs> Solomon says, would God dwell among man? How could God dwell in this house? The heaven and the heaven of heavens can't contain him. How would we think 
that flesh, that the creation could contain him. Can I say this finally? God loves man enough to come to him to offer forgiveness. God loves man enough to, to dwell. And, and Solomon says, you can't, you, the, you, the heaven of heavens couldn't contain you. And yet, you've heard the prayer of my Father. You've heard my prayer. You've answered that. And when we sin, you've promised that if we come to this place and we pray, you've promised that you would offer forgiveness. And now I'm here to tell you that the temple though it contained some of God, the presence of God, Jesus Christ in Him was all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Amen. That creation, in that creation, God existed and exists. And He did that so that we could come to Him and say, God, please forgive. God, can we come to you? Many Christians, unfortunately, live their lives outside of the presence of God. When I say the presence of God, it's certainly if you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit in you. But I'm talking about uh, many Christians live their lives and on a daily basis do not go to the throne of God through Jesus Christ. Many Christians... I, we have access to God's throne through Jesus Christ who came and, and dwelt among men and, and died on the cross as a sacrifice and then overcame death and, and the hell and the grave in his resurrection three days later that when the, when the disciples remembered at the resurrection, hey, he said this, this was the sign. Why we celebrate res uh, Resurrection Sunday, why we celebrate uh, uh, this Sunday and every Sunday is because of the sign that He gave that He would overcome death, hell, and the grave. Amen. He'd come back three days later. And still this earth can't contain Him. He ascended up into heaven. What's He doing in heaven now? What's He doing right now? He's the Advocate. Now listen, listen, I mentioned this. Many Christians go throughout life without ever going to the presence of God through the advocate of Jesus Christ the Father who gives us that ability because He died as a sacrifice and has overcome death, hell, and the grave through the resurrection. Many others can't come before the presence of God. You say, what do you mean they can't? The next chapter in the book of John, John chapter 3 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. Many have rejected Jesus Christ. Born condemned. I'm born, con I was born condemned. You were born condemned. And God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to be the sacrifice and then overcome death, hell, and the grave. As we look to Him, He will be the salvation. He is our salvation if we look to Him. But if we do not look to Him, we are already condemned. We have no ability to go before the presence of God. We have no advocate unto the Father. God desires to dwell among men. God desires for man to come to Him. Amen. If you have access, why don't you come to Him? And then, do you have access? If you've not believed on the name of the Son of God, if you've not believed on Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is not your advocate. That's right. Amen. Not only is there condemnation, uh, in regard to spending eternity in hell, but there's separation from God. God's not dwelling with us. We can't go before the presence of God. Condemnation. We must come to Him. That's why God sent His Son 
Jesus Christ. We celebrate the coming of his birth, and I think it's in the fall uh, when he actually came, but that's neither here nor there. But we know, based on the, the times of the Passover, that he came in the spring, or that he rose from the grave three days later in the spring based on the Passover. Have you trusted in Jesus Christ? Have you realized I can't come to God on my own? That my sin separates me from God? Have you, have you realized that in your sin, I know that I'm a sinner and I can't come before God, that I'm born condemned, a sinner condemned to hell and separated from God? I can tell you July 3rd, 1993, on nine, at 929 Big Bend Road, over in the old building, I bowed my head and I accepted I believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you point to a time when you were born again? John chapter 3. Not just born of water, but born of the Spirit. Can you point to a time? Do you have an advocate before the Father? If you do, spend time with Him. He desires to dwell among men. Dwell with Him. If you haven't, I beg and plead with you today. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Father in heaven, we thank you for your desire to dwell among men. We see in the book of 1 Kings, oh, what a wonderful day that would have been to be a part of. That's a day that I, I, I hope and desire one day to go back and be able to see in somehow. All that was the, the glory of God coming in a way that we don't see today, certainly. But that day is not to the extent that your son Jesus Christ came and dwelled on earth. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Not only did you become the sacrifice, or not only was your son the sacrifice, but three days later you overcame death, hell, and the grave. Your son overcame death, hell, and the grave that we might have eternal life and we might have an advocate with the Father that he's sitting on the right hand of uh, your right hand right now. In a moment when we close our pray prayer, we'll pray in Jesus' name because he is our advocate. Oh, we're so thankful that we can come to you. Lord, I beg and plead that you'd help us, Lord, to come before your presence daily, that we can come boldly before your throne. And if there are those that cannot come before your throne because they have not believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they do not have Christ as their advocate, today I pray that they would accept Christ as their Savior. I beg and plead in Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed. How many would say, Pastor? I believe that God desires to have a relationship with me. I believe that. I'll raise my hand by testimony. That's me. I believe that God desires to have a relationship with me. Thank you. Put your hands down. How many would say, Pastor, I know that my sin separates me from having a relationship with him. I understand that and I believe that. I'll raise my hand. That's me, Pastor. I believe it. I believe that. Thank you. Put your hands down. How many would say, Pastor, I've come to God in the name of Jesus Christ and ask him to save me. Ask Jesus Christ to forgive me of my sins. I can point to the day where I was born again. That's me all. Raise my hand. I can come to God. He's my, Jesus Christ, my advocate. Thank you. You can put your hands down. How many would say, Pastor, I have never accepted Christ as my Savior. I can't come to God in the name of Jesus Christ because I've not believed on His name. Well, I know that God d desires to dwell I know that God desires to know me and have a, a relationship with me. I know that he's done so much to come to me, but I've never trusted Christ. I've never put my belief in Jesus Christ for eternal life and for a relationship with God. Pastor, will you pray for me this morning? Will you pray for me? I, I've never done that. Will you pray for me this morning? I'll raise my hand and say, Pastor, would you pray for me this morning? Would you pray for me? Anyone like that? Here in a moment, we'll have the invitation. If you are a child of God, you are born again, make sure that you determine to have a relationship with God, a daily walk with Him. Be like Enoch, walk with God, please Him, preach for Him. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, then make today the day of your spiritual birthday where you accept Christ as your Savior, where you come to God and say, I know that I don't deserve to be in your presence. 
But I believe in Jesus Christ that He is the one that gives me salvation. To be in your presence and to have eternal salvation. Come down the aisle this morning. Take me by the hand. I'll take you to uh, someone who can take you, uh, take you to the Word of God and show you what the Bible says about biblical salvation. Father in heaven, bless this invitation. We pray in Jesus' name. Heads bowed and eyes closed. We stand to our feet. The piano and organist begin to play. Brother Harris begins to sing. The invitation's open now. Come down the aisle. If you're a Christian, you say, I need to spend more time in God's presence. He desires to dwell with me. Renew a desire today. If you do not know, Christ is your Savior.